Thank you so much, Gary and Alan, for joining us today uh, for this panel on Create, Preserve, and Empowering, uh, Adding Web3 Layers to Web2 Business Models. I'm so thrilled to talk to both of you guys as key experts in the space. You guys have also been in tech for a long time, but to kick us off, I do want to hear a little bit more about your personal journeys into Web3. Why now, after working for so long in, in the media or Web2 spaces, uh, and what was your personal why? What, what brought you to decide to take this leap? And Gary, I will call you, I think there was a Forbes <laughs> article or Fortune Mark article a while ago that was saying how you are leaving this South China Morning Post to work on NFTs. And I don't know if it was a positive or negative spin, but I want to hear your personal why. Well, I hope it was a positive spin. I'm actually not sure what article you're you're referring to. I do know that the fact that you pointed out that Alan and I have worked in the Web2 industry for a very long time makes both of us feel extremely old, which is, I mean, fr frankly, the truth when you compare us to uh, a lot of the folks that are coming in and leading the charge in Web3. Uh, my personal story is actually relatively simple on this. About four years ago, while I was still CEO at the South China Morning Post, actually relatively early on in the transformation journey of this very old newspaper, we started looking at blockchain technologies and how they would disintermediate uh, traditional media. And this was just part of our discipline of trying to figure out what was around the corner because the media industry had already been turned upside down by the internet. And frankly speaking, our newspaper peers and ourselves included were 15 years late to uh, figuring out internet economics, we wanted to make sure that whatever was around the corner uh, could not pull down and so fundamentally hurt the news industry yet again. Um, as I started looking at blockchain technologies, frankly, back then in 2018, we realized that the applications were not mature enough for a scaled media business, yet a lot of the technologies um, or a lot of the applications that were being built for media on blockchain were uh, for content management, uh, was for a content organization. And also, of course, there were um, experiments to use blockchain and blockchain-based governance uh, to determine truth from, uh, from fiction or non-truths. And again, all of those were a little bit too early. The governance structures weren't mature enough. And frankly speaking, the participation around the world uh, wasn't represented enough for us to jump into that fray. However, it became very clear that blockchain was going to fundamentally change digital media because there was a sense of intrinsic value that can be placed into the media world uh, because of authentication. So when 2021 rolled around and after three years of constantly updating our internal uh, positions on blockchain and media, uh, when 2020 rolled around, 2021 rolled around and the NFT world took off, it became very clear, this is the application. It's ready for a news organization as old as the South China Morning Post, as an opportunity for us to take what is most valuable about our assets, which is archives, find a new way to express them, find a new way to share them, and find a new way to monetize them. So um, we started working on a project internally called the Artifact Project, uh, which started off as a metadata schema or metadata standard project. Uh, and then over time, it evolved into NFT infrastructure, not only for SCMP, but eventually we thought, uh, let's spin it out and use this NFT infrastructure to empower other cultural, historical, and media organizations. Um, and that's what I'm working on now. So that's my journey. Uh, it started from one academic pursuit uh, and then led to, oh, goodness, this thing is going to change the world. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully contribute a little bit to how it helps the media space evolve. Amazing. And what about you, Alan? You obviously have spent time in insurance tech and then also in consulting, right? You've had careers in so many different areas. What made you decide to jump into Web3 now? And what was what was your why? Yeah, I'll tell you um, a little bit about my personal journey, not just in Web3, but also in Metaverse. So about 13 years ago in 2009, I, I worked with a contemporary artist called Chao Fei uh, to build a project called RMB City which is um, a, a sort of a makeup version of China on Metaverse, on Second Life at that time. And so the Second Life is basically the Metaverse platform before there is Minecraft and Roblox. Uh, so that was, you know, I was the mayor in, in, that, in that project. And I'm there to create policy and also to facilitate conversation and exchanges about culture. So fast forward, um, that's very much Web2, but the, the idea of Metaverse is there already. Fast forward to 
2017, uh, just like many other people, I started investing in crypto. And around the same time, that's when I joined Tencent from McKinsey. Um, so we started getting a lot of proposal because, you know, at that time, there was a lot of um, thinking around how blockchain can be applied to finance uh, insurance in particular. Unfortunately, a lot of the proposal I look at at that time doesn't have the product market fit. And I think Gary, Gary alluded to that just now as well, right, which is at the early stage of, of blockchain um, development, there was a lot of ideas, but it hasn't really found meaningful industry application. So, you know, I probably spent three years looking at blockchain proposal that doesn't work. And then fast forward again to 2021, and that's when uh, DeFi and NFT comes to form. And, you know, I think similar to, to Gary, in, at, at around that timing, I also see there's a product market fit. You know, that's when I get really interested uh, in NFT because, you know, I also have another interest, which is in, in the arts world. So I've been collecting and I sit on museum boards. And I think I can really see how Web3 technology can change the creator economy. And I think NFT really captures that super well. And that's when I get into the rabbit hole, started doing a lot of research, started investing, buying NFTs, and even get, get to the point of helping some of my artist friends create their own NFT project. So um, about a year ago, I helped um, a, a Chinese contemporary artist, uh, Xu Bing, launch a charity project where basically we're selling his artwork combined with kids drawing a tree. And when we sell that NFT, we use that money to plant trees in the real world, right? So um, really getting into the rabbit hole in 2021. Um, and that's around the same time when I sort of re-engage with, with uh, Animoca. So, you know, of course, Animoca is one of the uh, leading tech firms, uh, very few unicorns, uh, tech unicorns uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, have always known the team there. And, uh, you know, we started having conversation about blockchain. And, you know, I thought what would be more fun than going from a very hyper um, competitive market, but, but very well developed Web2 well into Web3. And I think Animoca uh, is really a fantastic platform to do that. And here I am. Well, that was a great introduction, both of you. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more of elaboration, um, Alan or Gary. Um, how are you guys currently incorporating traditional content into Web3? I know you guys know uh, what you're doing, but would love to hear a little bit more about some really exciting examples that most people wouldn't anticipate. For Alan, you mentioned museums and contemporary artists. Uh, Gary, I know a little bit about all the different amazing organizations that you're already engaging with but please elaborate a little further about what you guys are both individually excited about alan you want to go first yeah sure um any more mission is really about bringing mass onboarding uh, users from web 2 to web 3. so i think by definition we have to work with uh, a lot of what you call traditional industry so that can go from from music to movie to art to you know finance right so you know a, a core part of a mission is actually to work with those uh, established industry pair um and, and bring their user into into web3 so you know i think we work across the board i think a lot of the examples that you've seen has been around um industry where there are a lot of creators whether it is art and music uh recently we started looking into newer areas like education because in education we also is a big believer that um, teacher as a as a creator cohort is very undercompensated and is a very important for society. Um, so we think that's also another area that we can try to bring blockchain technology to mass on board users from Web two to Web three. No, that's terrific, Gary. And uh, Artif Artifact Labs, um, our mission is specifically to preserve and connect history on the blockchain. What that means to us is uh, we use our products and our platforms to help organizations that have historical archives replicate those archives in some way um, on the blockchain for preservation first, um, but then to make them available and uh, and sometimes actually co-owned by a community and then eventually using uh, using that, using those new products to create a new sustainable funding system for the continual preservation um, and capturing actually of history. Uh, so we work with a lot of traditional media. We work with a lot of old things, starting from the South China Morning Post, from which we were born. Uh, we, I, I mentioned earlier uh, archives. So the SCMP's first NFT drop were the 362 front pages from uh, 1997. These were the print front pages of the South China Morning Post um, 
created and 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 and, and printed and distributed uh, during that uh, incredibly pivotal year where Hong Kong was um, handed back to China uh, from British rule from 150 years of British rule. Um, but from there on, uh, the schema and the platforms are slowly being deployed to other organizations, historic brands that have historic uh, designs in archives that they want to make sure are recorded immutably and then be made available actually for some derivative works by other artists. We are working with auctioneers uh, and art galleries uh, to design ways for art to be shifted into the metaverse um, and also shared with more people for the sake of education, uh, something that I know that Anna Mocha and Ellen are, 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 are think a lot about. Uh, we are working with um, a traditional music organizations on how to preserve uh, not only full pieces, but even single notes of music uh, on the blockchain, as well as historical artifacts. Uh, and over time, our hope is that we will assemble an entire universe of historical memorabilia that all have the same metadata schema, so they can all be connected to each other in context, uh, and and again, be be available to the entire world for rediscovery. Amazing. Well, uh, one thing that is so interesting as, as this clip will debut at Filecoin Singapore in an Asia-focused audience is both of you guys are located in Hong Kong. And I would love to hear what the sentiment is like. Uh, I know, Alan, I stalked you a little bit. You, you've lived in London. You've lived in other spaces. And same with you, Gary. You've built businesses in the U.S. What is it like building a Web3 business in Hong Kong? How is the talent there compared to the rest of Asia? What is the sentiment for these traditional brands around Web3? Are they excited? Are they skeptical? Are they very eager to get started? So tell me more about uniquely the Hong Kong market. Well, I can jump in um, first. So I love building in Hong Kong. I think this is a really, really special place with a confluence of incredible talent uh, and and a cultural vibrancy as well. Um, and so building something truly creative in a new field with new technologies here in this city is a lot of fun. That said, um, it, you know, th there are some struggles being in this city. Talent is definitely one of the issues. Um, Hong Kong is not that big of a city, uh, 7 million people, but um, over the course of the last several years, largely because of COVID and the travel restrictions, a lot of Hong Kong's top talents have actually left Hong Kong, hopefully temporarily, but definitely uh, they're, they're not here right now. So there's been an exodus. Um, and, and so a lot of the engineers who can work from other places or work for international companies uh, have taken a sojourn and gone and experienced life outside of Hong Kong. And so it definitely is um, a, a, a supply problem. Uh, in Hong Kong. Definitely not a demand problem, but a supply problem. We're hoping that the borders of Hong Kong will open soon and talent will come flowing back in, not only from around the world, but definitely also from north of the border in Shenzhen and Guangzhou. Um, the second thing with building in Hong Kong is that uh, Hong Kong is still a relatively traditional place. Uh, and so the big companies that actually we get to work with, and Alec can tell, tell you more because Anamoka is definitely one of the favorites right, in, in Hong Kong, one of the golden children that a lot of the traditional brands rush to to learn about this new world. These brands are excited. They are, uh, they are curious. They want to experiment. But I must say that the speed at which they move sometimes uh, is still a little bit slow. There's still a lot of traditional bureaucracy. Um, and and you know, oftentimes with experiments, especially in the Web3 world, you make you come up with an idea, and if you don't execute it within three months, it's no longer new. Somebody else has already done it. And so when you have these six-month sales cycles, when you have ideation cycles that last another six months, that becomes a little bit difficult uh, to, to, to build. That, that kind of you know, cadence becomes a little bit difficult to build with. The third thing, which I think actually is more of an opportunity than a problem, is that um, regulation in Hong Kong and policy in Hong Kong is still a little bit opaque. Um, I do understand when entrepreneurs building in a uh, you know, in, in policy opacity might be scared off. And then there, there have been some companies over the course of the last few years for understandable reasons to have left Hong Kong and Hong Kong's Web3 or crypto marketplace. However, I think that for a lot of the new Web3 startups that are you know, being founded here in Hong Kong are sprouting up all over the place, um, we see an opportunity to actually help Hong Kong define what policy ought to be. And thankfully, we do have a government here in the city that is open to discussion, that is listening to, um, to, to operators, 
um, and to the creative talent in Hong Kong uh, and trying to understand what they want out of Web3 and how policy can help spur innovation here as opposed to dampen it. So that's the condition of building in, in Hong Kong. I really do think that this is a wonderful place. I think that this city um, has a very real chance of becoming one of the Web3 innovation centers of the world. I have a whole nother lecture on why I think that's possible. I won't go into it now, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Artifact Labs is based here. Amazing. And what about you, Alan? Um, would love to hear more. And as Gary mentioned, Annie Mocha is obviously a favorite in Hong Kong, but I would love to hear more about uh, what it's been like working from Hong Kong. And also, you know, it's kind of crypto winter right now. So what was that experience mm. like? As much yeah. as you can <laughs> share. Yeah. Uh, but first, I think, you know, people of Hong Kong has always been known for being agile and flexible and learning really fast. And that really helps when, you know, in an industry like Web3, which is changing so quickly. While, you know, obviously blockchain didn't really, the epicenter really isn't in Hong Kong, it's more likely to be, you know, seen as in the West, in the US in particular. Um, we do have um, uh, China, which is just across the border, which was, you know, the, the basis of a lot of blockchain activities, specifically mining uh, since a couple of years ago. So that created a whole a talent pool of blockchain literate developers and entrepreneurs that, you know, clearly has a spillover effect in Hong Kong. If you look at the community here, and there are quite a lot of people that have moved over here, but also in Singapore, of course, right? But move some, some station in Hong Kong to create sort of the next gig uh, in blockchain. Um, I, I think for us, you know, we've, you know, benefited a lot from that. And uh, we have 150 people in Animoca in Hong Kong. We do have an international footprint. We have another seven, 800 that are outside, but I think that's really taking advantage of the full of what Hong Kong has to offer, right? I think it's a great base to start. We do have people, you know, of course, you always want more talent and you want to be diversified. That's why we have a global footprint. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, what's really taking for Hong Kong is still here, despite, you know, all that we've seen in the last two years with the quarantine and, and, and COVID policy, which is, I think, Hong Kong remain a very low tech space center. So, you know, that is a huge advantage to a global business, right? Um, where we can hub our activities in Hong Kong. And second, it remains an international city, despite the fact that there's been people that's been moving out. But, you know, I think since once past August uh, this year, we've seen a lot of my expert friends coming back and a lot of them really missing Hong Kong, saying that, oh my God, I'm finally coming back to a city where things just worked, right? Mm -hmm. So while we have people going, leaving, but we also have people coming back and or even coming in, you know, actually our team, we just have five people in the last two weeks that came in from other places in the world to be relocated in Hong Kong, right? So I think we still have influx of talent um, you know, of course, just like Gary, I hope that the quarantine policy will live very soon. But I think a lot of things that were humming for Hong Kong continues to be the case. So I think it is a great place to build. Amazing. Um, to, to, regarding your second question about um, sort of building through crypto winter, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it is never easy when, when you have to navigate through uh, such drastic changes, I would say, right? I think it's, you know, not just a turn in sentiment, but also, you know, a lot of rethink on what are the real business model that would stake, right? And I think for us, um, we, we, you know, we, we, we try to embrace that and say, you know, we're not trying to estimate when this will end or when things will pick up. But this thing is just a great time for us to focus on building uh, because, uh, as you know, and everyone who's lived through the past year or year and a half, who lived through the, the euphoric period of crypto, I would say, uh, in, in recent history, um, would, would notice that it is very difficult to hunker down and build when there is just so much activity going on. And I think, so we, we're looking at it from, from positive lens to say, you know, let's look back at all the projects to look at what are the ones that's worth doubling to, uh, up our time on, what are the things that really we should have built and, and really make use of the time here, well, before the next cycle picks up. No, amazing. And I asked that question because I know you guys just recently announced a massive round raised. So just wanted to call that out as being so exceptional, especially in this time to really um, mm. sh shine through with, with showing that you are building and, and, and yeah. fully full throttle on, on, Thank you. on raising. 
Um, so uh, this last question is going to be a little bit biased towards me. Um, obviously, both of you guys are familiar with what Filecoin does. Um, you guys are obviously very aware of distributed storage. I would love to hear about how open source distributed storage solutions like Filecoin are prevalent or you know what is related in your current work, right? So Gary, I know you spent a lot of time on the archival side and obviously, Alan, for you, you've invested in a lot of companies and you guys are constantly thinking about about how to be fully distributed, not just in the way that culture and brands uh, are, are, are pushed out, but also actually in infrastructure. So either one of you guys, feel free to start. I can start. It's, it's relatively easy from my side. Um, if we're going to serve organizations that have things of historical value, and we are going to tell them that blockchain is um, is not only a great way, but arguably the most, the safest way to, uh, to store and preserve these archives, we have to have a storage solution that they can trust. Um, and, and, and Filecoin has so far fit the bill for the South China Morning Post, as well as for other partners that we're speaking to. And we're glad that the Filecoin Foundation is there. We're glad that, um, that Protocol Labs over the years have developed these solutions for uh, organizations like ours and for missions like, like ours. Uh, to know that blockchain is immutable, great, awesome. But that's the actual NFT, that's the certificate, that's the smart contracts. The assets, the underlying assets that we're putting out there into the ether, um, that we wanna make sure is also stored properly and as immutably as possible. Uh, when we're talking about our archives at the South China Morning Post, and this is the same for any other me uh, uh, media organization, as well as, of course, museums, uh, the, we spend an exorbitant amount of money every single year making sure those archives, both physical and digital, are safe. On the physical side, you can understand where all the cost goes. Um, you know, Climate-controlled rooms under lock and key, the teams to uh, the library resourcing, content resources teams to maintain those making sure that we test the sprinkler systems every single year, buying a heck of a lot of insurance just in case something were to happen. And even on the digital side, um, there is so much you know, uh, work that goes into making sure that even though we're using centralized cloud storage, that they're on servers and countries that are as distributed as possible. We're constantly testing for uh, contingencies and then technological dependencies to make sure that a single company, a single government, or a you know a series of unfortunate events cannot destroy our digital archives. It's going to be the same when we put everything onto blockchain. We'll tr trust those certificates on the major layer ones, but the underlying storage um, solutions also have to be fully trusted by us, by curators, by digital owners, and also by all the historical institutions that we're trying to bring onto our standard. Amazing. What about you, Alan? I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I think as Gary said, you know, NFT is the ledger, but you know, the the music file, the JPEG, the video file is not stored there, right? And it it's some, you know, I think it needs to be with a trusted provider like Filecoin. And you know, of course, uh, I think Animoca and Filecoin is completely vision aligned in that we believe in the future of decentralization. I don't think the world should store one hundred percent of its data in AWS. Just just the wrong way to go for so many reasons. Um, uh, and and so therefore, I think you know, we 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 definitely need um, a decentralization solution in storage, right? Where I think it really is a great example of how do you tokenize an operation to incentivize everyone where it's just not held by, you know, one or two, probably two powerful company and you, you, you distribute that right to own, to serve um, and, and, and to collaborate um, through the launch of a platform like um, and Falcon. So, so I think, you know, that that really is an interesting innovation that goes hand in hand with the NFT revolution that we've been talking about. Amazing. Um, so I have one last question for both of you guys, which is we have an incredible gathering of over a thousand investors, startups, community members here in Filecoin Singapore. I would love to hear what you guys are looking for. Where can this community help you guys the most? Mm -hmm. What's on the frontier next on your horizon um, where this community can help you guys the most and how do they reach out? Sure, I mean, I think um, in terms of where we are, we, uh, we, we're we gonna be speaking at, um, at different events. So, you know, come find us. 
uh, we also had a little gathering. So, you know, I think we've, you know, sent our invitation list. So, you know, come join us if you can. But I think more broadly in terms of, you know, what we'll be looking for at the event as well, I think is a great, um, uh, in, in fact, I think it is the, the first big gathering of the crypto community in Asia for a very long time. So, you know, I think we, we're really looking forward to meeting our partners there uh, on site. Um, you know, I, I think it's also a great time to be meeting startups. So, you know, we'd definitely be putting out our sort of investment antenna on uh, to, to for exciting opportunity. We also have a couple of our portfolio company to speak um, uh, during during the week. So uh, one of them is actually Tiny Taps, the, the one that I mentioned about education. So, you know, look out for us when you're in Singapore. Incredible. Uh, and I will say, I think uh, we have an amazing community that would be thrilled to to work with with you guys in so many different ways. What about you, Gary? Um, what are you, what, what can the community and the crowd at Filecoin Singapore do where you guys are are building the next frontier? Well, first of all, don't have too much fun because I don't want to be super jealous the fact that I'm missing the actual festivities <laughs> in Singapore this year. Um, but the, 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 from a community standpoint, what we are trying to establish at Artifact Labs um, is a standard for how to record history and historical assets on the blockchain. And a standard needs to be community owned. It needs to evolve with the needs of the community. Um, it needs to evolve with institutions who really want to bring their assets into this world. So we're trying to have lots of conversations. So if you um, are part of an organization that has archives that wants to uh, what actually wants to feed into how the metadata standard ought to evolve in V2, V3, V4, wants to have conversations about how these assets can be used to develop truly engaged communities of collectors and help fund the long-term preservation of history. I'm all ears. Um, this is meant to be a community project. Not only is there going to be a, hopefully a global collector community, but also a global standard setting community with us as well. So please do reach out. Um, for yeah, for, for those conversations. And also, I just love the idea that as we continue to build in Asia, that we are truly forming a world-class um, Web3 uh, web, right, of talent and of ideas in this part of the world. I actually think that for developing nations across Asia, uh, Web3 and the applications of blockchain technology makes so much sense. Um, I think that Asian countries and Asian entrepreneurs and Asian companies should be leading the charge and how we move from a centralized internet towards a decentralized future. So I really am going to miss everything that's going on in Singapore uh, during the next couple of weeks, um, but I hope to meet many, many of the folks in the audience um, and entrepreneurs, as well as investors. Please do reach out. I would love to have conversations. Amazing. Well, thank you both of you guys for, for joining, joining me today. Um, thank you so much for these amazing words of wisdom. We're so thrilled to, to have you guys present today. So thank you. Thank you for having thank us. You.